probably fall on my way up. Um, innovative is secret code word by my team for what crazy idea is he doing now. Um, and so I just found a way to like make that part of the thing. So um, first thing I want to plug, Nick Page. Uh, some of the photos that are in this are, um, he's a photographer in our local area. Um, and he really can capture um, sort of the dynamic of, of living in a rural environment. And hopefully I can figure this out. There we go. So rule is very broadly defined. Let me go back one real quick. OK. The who? <laughs> God, it's my, it's my entrance song. I got it. <laughs> it was a little late. <laughs> this thing is like, what's that? Go back one slide. OK, go for it. All right. So rule is broadly defined, 30 out of 39 counties in Washington state are rural. And so from a Columbia County perspective, we're rural. Um, public hospital district has about 5,300 people on it. Right next door is rural Walla Walla with about 50,000 people in it, okay? And so it's really important to kind of understand um, the variances and nuances associated with rural frontier or rural Pasco or rural Yakima. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, I did a, a speak, uh, speech, in, uh, a speech in Washington D.C. and you know we were talking about rural Maryland and some of the rural Pennsylvania, and they really don't have a concept for what rural truly is. Rural Maryland, eighty-five thousand people. Okay, like rural Dayton, like as far as the eye can see, four point seven people per square mile. Uh, lots and lots of acres of expansion. No. Um, it's just wheat and, and farms and um, amazing skies. Um, I found myself trying to argue often why we even need healthcare and rural. In fact, this is a discussion I've been in with a professor at uh, the University of Washington. You guys have worse outcomes, you're more expensive, people can drive 30 minutes. You know, we don't really say the same thing about kids in schools, right? We don't say, let's shut down those schools in Dayton because there's not enough kids in the, in the schools, and let's just bus them all to uh, an urban center. But for some reason, there's this thing about 35 minute drive times from the front door of my hospital to the front door of another hospital. The problem is that people don't live in my parking lot. You know, they, they live way out and about, and you know, the drive time isn't really 30 minutes, it's 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half sometimes to get to the next larger uh, tertiary center. Rural is where we recreate. About 60,000 skiers in, um, in our ski resort in Dayton. Yes, there's a ski resort in Dayton. Um, 200,000 visitors to Palouse Falls every year. We're actually the closest hospital to Palouse Falls. It's easier for people to get to us than it is to get to the hospital in Whitman. Um, new energy frontiers, they're, they're not being built in downtown Seattle, they're being built in Columbia County. Um, and the interstates and state routes, they all traverse these rural environments. And, and healthcare is a little bit like a utility. When you walk into your room, you flip a light switch, you sort of expect the lights to come on. If you have an emergency out and about driving between you know, Spokane and Seattle, there's an expectation that there's help close by. And so there really is you know, a good reason or a good argument for having rural healthcare. Um, we rank fifth in the nation for wheat production. 60% of the wheat comes from south, southeastern Washington. 46% of the nation's soft white wheat, those are our cakes and cookies, uh, Columbia County in southeastern Washington. 56% um, of the Washington's wind energy is produced in southeastern Washington with a full 26% of that in Columbia County. There's workforces that are needed to keep those things going. They deserve health care, they deserve education, they deserve a quality of life. So a little bit about Dayton specifically from a demographic, 28% of the population is over 65. And so if you look at the national and state averages of 16 and 15%, you can see we're quite a bit older. In addition to that, the median age is 50.2 years. Again, um, quite a bit older than the 37 and 38 years of uh, Washington State and the national. And here's the sort of the warts of Columbia County. Um, we rank near the bottom of the state for health outcomes. It's really not surprising, older, sicker population, um, poverty is a factor, um, lifestyle choices are a factor, and so we really are ranked near the bottom for health outcomes, and we're ranked to the lower middle um, for health factors, which is the air quality, the environment. Our payer mix, heavy, heavy Medicare, Medicaid. 
And even that little part that says other, when you take um, federal forest service guys that work in the area that are insured by the government, um, schools, counties, um, other municipalities, um, that 12% actually ends up being a lot of government payers as well. And so really at the end of the day, we're almost 70% government payers. Apparently it's the flare. <laughs> so um, I'm really spending a lot of time on this. This is something I'm very passionate about. Um, our health systems are fractured. We chase the money. Um, we chase the service lines that have high returns. Um, we try to dump the service lines that don't. And really what it equates to is we could do this and this for you, but you got to go here to get something else. And if you have the wrong payer, here could be two and a half hours or three hours away. Okay. And so we do, because we're small, because we're rural, because we're cost-based reimbursed, um, both in our hospital and our rural health clinics, it affords us the ability to be a little bit more creative than a lot of other health systems. I don't want to defer or detract you from thinking that you can't be creative, because I think you can. I think there's a lot of potential out here to, to look for those pockets where there isn't revenue and find a way to backfill those so that you can get your alignment through the normal fee-for-service things that you do and the encounter rates, but also subsidize some of these other projects that don't necessarily have a um, revenue stream. Primary care, behavior health, uh, dental care is a big one in rural. 50% um, of my population hadn't, adult population hadn't had a checkup in over two years for dental care. Okay, and that, a little bit later on, I'm gonna see why that's important. Collaborative care, palliative care, there is no billing code for palliative care. It is, it is an incredible service line that does exactly what we want to in a healthcare transformation perspective that is, has, has no direct funding stream at all. Um, community health workers, again, wonderful, huge resource for our patients, no revenue stream associated. Uh, community partnerships, hospital-based services, and long-term care. Um, this state's been underfunding long-term care for decades. Um, Medicaid reimbursement rates are half the cost of care for um, skilled nursing patients. 60% um, of our palliative care patients have behavior health diagnosis. 63% uh, of, of our chronic care management patients have co-occurring behavior health. If we're not integrating behavior health, what are we doing? Like, look, those numbers are substantial. You may be able to deal with some of the clinical aspects of it, the, the, the diabetes and some of the COPD, but if you're not dealing with the depression or if you're not dealing with the anxiety or the co-occurring um, mental illness, you're not gonna make an impact on those other uh, areas. And so I kinda wanna go through some case studies. When um, I presented to you all in spring, it seemed like the people and the patients really resonated. And so I wanted to sort of paint a picture for what this looks like. So our first case, 53-year-old female with need for dental work. Um, she had medical comorbidities, um, type 2 diabetes, smoker, ADHD, anxiety, shoulder and back pain. Um, sort of list out the services that, that she makes use of. Dental and transportation. Um, transportation services has been a huge, um, it has had a huge impact in our organization. You, there's no CPT code for transportation necessarily. If you can get funded through People for People or something like that, it's great. But I live in, like, I've showed you pictures, right? I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And so, you know, to line up People for People, one time we had a driver come from Yakima to Dayton to take a patient to Walla Walla. That doesn't make any sense. And it was like an act of Congress to get it set up. And so we actually dusted off, uh, we had an old Econoline Transit van, 224,000 miles on it. And we said, you know, we're gonna start doing transportation. Um, that poor vehicle, we thought it would be like local, you know, stay close to home. It was going to Tri-Cities, it went to Idaho, um, it's been all over the place. It's approaching 300,000 miles. The good news is, I have four vehicles now and six drivers. Um, because the program needs just keep expanding. But what we found is the no-call, no-show rate drops. And so you don't have providers and nurses just waiting for a patient that didn't show up. Uh, outcomes are improving because people are getting actually treated instead of missing their appointments. Um, we're not having those conversations that are degrading for the patient. Why can't you make your appointment? Well, because I, I don't have a reliable car. My brother-in-law didn't pick me up. I was supposed to get a ride from so-and-so. They never showed. I mean, none of those conversations are positive. They just almost drain our patients. Um, they're embarrassing conversations to have. And so now what we do is we just know which patients need transportation or it's one of the questions we ask in intake. And then we make that available. Um, so interesting about this patient is she was one of the adults that hadn't had a, a oral checkup for quite some time. 
We have one dentist in town. He takes all of the Medicaid beneficiaries that he can, but the fact is the, the reimbursement, Medicaid reimbursement for dental doesn't even come close to covering the cost of care. They may get like $7 for you know, an oral treatment that takes 45 minutes. Interestingly enough, um, FQHCs and RHCs can get reimbursed at encounter rate levels for dental care. And so I really have to um, applaud a couple of the um, public hospital districts in the state, um, primarily uh, Klickitat and Jefferson, who actually started dental clinics in their rural health care um, clinics. And we actually went and did the same thing. And so um, we, um, we got a grant, in a sense, to build the clinic. We got a couple of operational grants to get it off the ground. And, and this is why it's important. This patient came in for um, her oral checkup and oral cleaning. And um, she had a lesion in her mouth that is usually associated with mouth cancer. A lot of people think that dents is a lot about the teeth and the gums, and it is. But those oral checkups they do also are looking for mouth cancers and things that can um, cause morbidity, uh, mortality and morbidity. Um, the patient, um, under normal circumstances, because of this lesion and the need for a biopsy, we probably would have had to transport her at least two hours away. Because you're looking for an oral surgeon now who will take Medicaid. And again, same problem applies. They don't get reimbursed to provide that service. But she works alongside a bunch of primary care doctors that do core biopsies all the time. We have a procedure room, we have all the tools we need. And so our dentist spent time talking to our primary care docs and talked to the patient and everybody was like, I think we're comfortable doing this. And so we did the biopsy in the building, um, anesthetized the tongue, sent the biopsy out. We didn't have to transport, we didn't have to dis uh, inconvenience the patient, we didn't have to go looking for somebody two and a half hours away to take care of this patient. So um, a couple of things about funding alignment. You know, DSHS will pay an encounter rate for dental service in RHCs and FQHCs. And so it actually covers literally the cost of care. It's not a profit center, but it covers cost of care. Um, we uh, got about $350,000 um, for the construction of the building. We got two roughly $90,000 grants for the first couple of years. And then funding sources for transportation, um, it is just a patchwork quilt of what we can get. Some of it's local health improvement networks. Some of it is from the Accountable Communities of Health. Um, we have local partners within the community that help subsidize it. We recently received a grant for $30,000 to cover per mile to keep this program going. And to a certain extent, some of the expenses are allowed on the cost report. Okay. So case two, a uh, female patient, early 50s, um, socioeconomic distress, substance use issues, severe diabetes, diabetic wounds, um, history of amputations. When you think about a patient that has started that amputation process, the cost of care for that patient goes up year over year as their disease progresses, especially if we're not managing their wounds. And so anybody who's participating in ACOs know that when those high cost beneficiaries hit your ACO, um, it makes it very difficult to achieve the shared savings that you would like. And so we wrap a ton of services around these patients. Palliative care team, chronic care management, primary care, transportation, wound care, um, these palliative care nurses are just stunning. Um, they will take calls almost night and day, and they serve patients in the home. We're able to bill for the nurse to do home visits. We can do providers in the home. There are certain things we can't cover. There are certain things like when the patient calls with anxiety at 10 o'clock at night and says, I think I'm having heart palpitations, I need to go to the ER. Nurse does a complete assessment, talks to the patients, comes out, it's just anxiety. We just defrayed an ER visit, so we drop that cost of care. But the other thing that we did is we misaligned our reimbursement at that point. I get paid for the ER visit. I do not get paid for that call to that nurse at 10 o'clock at night just to settle the patient down, okay? And so I have to keep finding innovative ways to make up for those gaps. So this patient started on chronic care management um, and actually she got um, transferred from palliative care to um, chronic care management. Then she ended up having surgery um, with her diabetes, that surgery led to a wound. We pushed her back towards the palliative care team who started working with the patient in the home. Patient became stabilized again and eventually made it back to chronic care management. And so that's the other thing is meeting the patient where they're at on their care continuum. And it is a very forward and backward thing. And it can be in the home, it could be in the assisted living, it could be in the skilled nursing, um, it could be the chronic care management team, the ER team. At any given point in time, it could be a team caring for this patient. But these palliative care program nurses and chronic care management nurses are pulling all that information constantly back together so that we can coordinate the care between the different care teams. 
So um, rural health clinics, um, we're in a home health shortage area that allows us to get reimbursed for the nurses' time in the home. Uh, wound care services, um, outpatient hospital-based programs, so we get paid um, either cost-based rates if it's a Medicare beneficiary or we get um, fee-for-service charge master rates for it as an outpatient service. And again, transportation um, funded through various mechanisms. Um, and, and up to and including, how do you give transportation credit for filling all the missed appointments that would have happened if they didn't exist? I mean, we got to start putting numbers to these things that are called soft numbers because our CFOs don't like soft numbers because you can't really put a number to it. But if we don't start justifying those things and looking at it from a data perspective, it becomes hard to, to create the argument to keep doing these things. So case three, um, I'm a male in his early 80s, um, heart failure, shortness of breath, uh, again, palliative care, um, very, very tough case, challenging case, needed the in-home care, but was embarrassed because he was living in an environment where there was hoarding. And so didn't want the nurse in, in his home. So sort of phone calls, uh, having to come in to the clinic, but the nurses are really good about checking in with these patients and keeping the charts updated. Um, this particular patient um, called with a worst, worsening shortness of breath one day, talking to his uh, nurse, um, we convinced the patient that they needed to come into the ER. EMS brought him to the ER. He was admitted with COVID. Uh, very tough conversations at, at that age that, that these teams are having with these patients, but they're very important. How many people have an average um, referral to death time in hospice of like two days? Like we all do. We almost never get our patients onto hospice in time. In fact, we refer to hospice and then we get the paperwork done and oftentimes the patient passes away before we even get the program um, functional. And so, you know, our partnership, when I said community partners, hospice is one of our community partners. And there's a lot of education that goes on. This patient made the decision that they didn't want treatment and they were willing to refer to hospice and hospice got them set up in the home. Our, our transportation community health workers helped with some of the hoarding issues to get them a place to be. And that gentleman um, ended up passing. And it was really tough for the team, but it actually functioned the way it was supposed to function. These were warm handoffs, and we had a great relationship with the patient. And we honored his decisions. So the Partners for Improving Health is this uh, multi-agency um, partnership that we have with ALTC and hospice and a few other agencies. It's a five-year HRSA grant, pays about $250,000 a year. Um, covers some really incredible in-home technology. Um, people can have an app on their phone and the patient could either um, put in information or it could come from a Bluetooth device like a blood pressure cuff uh, or it can come from an in-home caregiver or even our palliative care nurses could fill out this information. But it, it's basically dynamically feeding the system. And we can track and trend over time. Blood pressure going up, um, sugar rates um, for diabetes going out of control, that type of thing. And then we actually proactively call and say, hey, you need to come in. And you know everybody's worried about how complex these things are, but it literally is happy frowny faces. Like a lot of it is very easy for the patient to do uh, and to report into. The devices are very easy in the home as well uh, from a Bluetooth perspective. And so that's one of the avenues that we've used for home monitoring. Um, the palliative care and chronic uh, management team, again, nurse home visits are paid for. Eating acute care services coming right off the rate schedule. Um, and then, you know, referring to hospice and keeping hospice at the table for that education as we go along. It's all part of it. And when you think about how palliative care and hospice work, um, we've seen a 65% reduction in ER visits on our palliative care panel, okay? And so that's really building cost savings. That's really building and uh, detracting from the unnecessary ER visits that we were talking about earlier that we're having trouble staffing. Uh, a lot of the, our nurse time in the home is defraying nurse time at the hospital bed, okay? And so some of these things that we're working on right now are directly attributed to some of the challenge that we're facing as an industry with nurse uh, staff shortages, trying to get more proactive and push the care um, farther away from the front door and out into the community. So notes on funding, 340B, um, I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody, anytime that becomes attack, please fight, bring out the pitchforks, torches, light them on fire, go, go get them. We, we don't want any reduced funding on that 340B because it's helping us sustain a lot of these programs. Um, we've had several years of financial contributions from the Greater uh, Health Now Group, which is, was formerly the Greater Columbia Accountable Communities of Health. 
they've contributed about almost a million dollars from that demonstration funding that really helped build a lot of these population health initiatives. And then local health improvement networks still getting funding from HRSA and other places. Uh, everywhere we can, $10,000 here, $15,000 there, $30,000 here. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but in a rural environment, it does stretch when you're talking about covering community health workers or transportation. So a couple notes on program sustainability. It's not, it's not easy. Like, like turnover in the behavioral health team is amazingly uh, difficult to deal with. You get the perfect person, you get the right fit, you start building a panel. Two years into it, they burn out, they flame out, they go somewhere else. And so then you're left recruiting, you get a gap in your, um, your integrated care model. Um, and then you got to bring the right person on board and hopefully they do mix really well. The work is tough. Um, you know, in traditional sense, integrated care, um, seasonal depression. I always have time around Christmas. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, well, they came in with a PHQ-9 uh, that showed clinically depressed, but then a couple of sessions are back on top, they get the remission, and you discharge them from the program. We bring our patients in and we find childhood trauma, PTSD, just, we, there's nowhere to refer them to, you can't get them out to a psychiatrist, Psych psychiatric rate for children is six months, and so a lot of these folks just stay in our program, and our um, licensed social workers are really challenged um, on a day-to-day -day basis to be um, taking care of these patients. And so we've had a lot of turnover. It's part of the deal. I mean, we can't let it turn us away from what is the right thing to do. And we keep working hard to recruit and refine and um, build robust partnerships. Um, we've had a great partnership with the University of Washington for the last five years. UW psychiatrists are consulting directly with our primary care physicians. They're um, doing a little bit of face-to-face -face time with the patients. They're working with our social workers. Um, and so one psychiatrist can cover multiple areas. Um, we were just informed that UW doesn't have enough psychiatrists to cover their own programs. We were the last program, outside program, that they were supporting. And they said, Shane, we can't do it anymore. And so again, these setbacks, absolutely going to happen. Plan on them happening. Start building SWAT, start looking at your, your risks, start looking at your program risks, and start planning on those things to happen. Don't sit down and say, oh, I got an LICW covered. We're good. I can move on to something else. Keep focusing on keeping that position stabilized and reinforce it and keep looking for people to help participate. Find ways to offload those behavior health workers. Financial sustainability is challenging when revenue is tied to you know, finite funding sources, like grants, five years. You know, what happens at the end of five years? Um, I don't think this, again, should discourage us from building these programs and doing it, because one of the important things that we need to do while we're in those windows is collect the data, tell the story. Because before, you couldn't even tell the story because you didn't have any of the patient care, you didn't have the cases, you didn't have the collection of how many appointments we were able to defray or how many uh, palliative care uh, patients stopped using the ER and inpatient, but now we can actually translate those into real savings and go back to either um, the HCA or the payers directly if we can and say, hey, look, we're, we're doing these things. It's in your best interest to fund them. But if we don't have the data, we don't have the story. And sometimes the data takes a while. And I would say day one, start focusing on how the analytics are going to look and what you want to track on that. Lastly, it's a wicked question. I don't know if any of you guys have ever structured uh, systems. It's an interesting way to spur communication. But um, Washington State hospitals have lost $1.7 billion in the first six months of the year. Most of you are likely aware of that. WISH has been doing surveys on it. There hasn't been uh, appreciable increases in Medicaid rates for 20 years. Um, given all of that, you know, should we wait for federal, state, or private insurers to create reimbursement streams to support these things? Or do we redesign our services and then pursue funding to make it happen, then use that data to encourage change? And the reason I ask this is because we're all just struggling to carve pennies and you know, we're, we're trying to pick up savings everywhere we can. You know, it isn't just a, a tale of more nurses. I mean, it isn't like, hey, you're gonna build these programs, gonna push a bunch more nurses in there, and then we can finally have this crush of patients come into our acute care and ER. Some of it is, how do we stop that from happening to begin with? Even with really chronically sick people. Um, I have this, this nurse in Dayton, her name's Teresa, and, and she is loved and hated. But if I had a progressive chronic debilitating disease, I'd want her as an advocate. She'll run 10.30 at night. She'll come to your house. What can I help you with? My wound vac is not working. My bandage fell off. She'll rebandage the patient. 
Um, we've got um, the great fortune of having some really impassioned people working for us that, that really care about the outcomes of their patients. And so it does take some special individuals who are completely dedicated to this task. But the rewards are obvious and the data tells the story. Okay. And so I wanted to give Mike plenty of time to cover his, um, his topics. But I think you're going to find some similarities and overlap in some of what we were talking about with these programs. It is not linear. Um, your, your plot from A to B ends up looking like um, over the hill and through the woods. Um, but it's good work. It's rewarding work. Mike? Thank you. All right, so I have the, oh. um, just testing that. Sound OK? Thumbs up? OK, great. Um, so I have the, uh, the pleasure of following on, uh, on Shane's really, I just think it's really an inspiring presentation. I, I, I saw you speak in March, and uh, we connected afterward. Um, one of the things that I think, and I've got a subtitle here for my part of the presentation, Innovative Clinical Programs Require Innovative Funding Models, and we're, we talk a lot about innovation. I think you know, one of the things that's really inspired me about hearing Shane speak is that as healthcare leaders and finance and operations, clinical leaders uh, as well, um, it, it behooves us to not, and I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that anyone is, 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 has this narrow focus, but we spend a lot of time at our conferences talking about revenue cycle. It is always one of my top three priorities in my organization. Uh, it is cumbersome, complicated, and challenging to be paid appropriately for the great care that we deliver. At the same time, our communities need programs that don't have standard funding sources through insurers, through payers. Uh, we have needs in our communities and in the populations that we serve that are broader and deeper than what we have, than what, what we can submit a claim for to a payer. So, so I want to talk a little bit about some of our examples of those, uh, a little bit about my organization to start, and just a few words about me. Um, I've, uh, I've been in healthcare uh, here in Washington State in the Puget Sound area since uh, 1992. I started working at Group Health when it was still Group Health. Uh, worked there for 21 years, uh, took an eight-year hiatus, worked as an independent consultant, and now I have been with Sound uh, since March of this year as the CFO. So a little bit about Sound. Um, there. Uh, Sound has been around as long as I have. Founded in 1966. I was founded in 1966 as well. Um, <laughs> and... Um, uh, but we are a comprehensive provider of behavioral health services. Used to be called Seattle Mental Health Institute, then changed to Seattle Mental Health, and then as we broaden our, our, our care delivery to more broadly in King County, changed to Sound Mental Health, and then just for short, Sound or Sound Health. So, um, but, uh, but we're about, um, you know, you talked about your funding sources. We're mostly a Medicaid uh, population is mostly what we serve. Um, and then in addition to that, other, like you said, also the other is, is largely comprised of other federal or state funding sources. So, um, so in a very interesting funding model, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, we have, uh, from a, on the clinical side, we have an evidence-based model. It's called reaching recovery. The idea with, uh, it, with using an evidence-based model in behavior health, this may be familiar to a lot of folks, is that, is that trying to avoid the, the, the circular, um, the reality of being in treatment forever. Um, and, and instead, using a really goals-oriented approach to saying, is there a level, can you graduate from your behavioral health treatment? And what is that path to graduation? It might take a year, it might take 10 years, or you might be graduating to a higher level of functioning that requires less intervention uh, over time, but it's still a recovery-based model. Um, and so, we have, uh, we have about a dozen outpatient day treatment centers. We also do school-based in-home care. We have three inpatient facilities. We're opening up a new inpatient facility actually next year. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's an expanded services facility. It's a step down from Western, basically, um, for discharges or for avoiding an admit to Western. Uh, about 60 million in annual revenue. It's gonna be closer to 70 next year. Um, one of the things that's exciting for us um, because you know, I've worked in healthcare now for 30 years and understand a lot of different reimbursement models. Um, and I, I'm just continued to, to be astonished by how we get paid, which is different than anything I'd seen before. Um, but there, there is, um, there, there's an analog in behavioral health care uh, to the federally qualified health center model, FQHC. There's a CCBHC, a certified community behavioral health center. 
Washington State has not adopted that model yet, that payment model, but Sound just is one, uh, just one grant, one of seven organizations in the state uh, to be awarded a SAMHSA grant, a four-year uh, de capability development grant to become a CCBHC, as Washington State is considering bringing that model. And so that will potentially help our reimbursement uh, significantly. And um, uh, so again, you know, I already talked about services, um, outpatient mental health, behavioral health, substance use disorder, and we have residential inpatient services, a lot of family-oriented services, child and family services, domestic violence, uh, family counseling. Um, we do a lot of homeless support for folks with behavioral and mental health uh, issues, needs, uh, people who uh, need help finding housing, people who need help sustaining or being stable in their housing uh, as part of our services as well. Uh, so here's a little bit, you're not going to be able to read those numbers, that's not the point, it's more the color coding. I wanted to give a little bit of the financial context for, again, uh, the, the reason for this talk. The financial context, and you know, this is probably true in various ways everywhere in healthcare over the past couple of decades, reimbursement is changing. It's getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Um, every time you turn around, someone says, oh, we're gonna pay you less for that, or you know, we're gonna contract differently for that, or uh, that's no longer covered, or there's just constant things that are, that are changing. And so, so, you know, three, four years ago, we were paid on a capitation basis for clients in just in general outpatient mental health services, capitation basis. So, you, so a client under care, um, we've admitted a client to, our, to one of our programs, and then we get paid on a capitation basis. So that changed about three years ago uh, and, and, and went from a model where we got paid on a capitation basis. So, so that, you know, that patient might require an hour of service a month, seven hours of service a month. They might go a couple of months and not, and not need service, or they might disengage from service. We were still, as long as they were admitted uh, as, a, as, a, as a patient, um, I'll use client and patient interchangeably because, um, because we typically use client and I, you know, I grew up in, in, in hospitals and other ambulatory care where we use patients. So don't, so if I do that, just don't find that confusing. But the point is the model, the payment model changed a couple of years ago from a cap model to now you're going to get paid this interesting mix of fee for service. It's basically we get paid an acuity adjusted per diem with a performance uh, with a perf with with uh, with a performance um, percentage. So so if we so based on someone's acuity level, right? So say you're sort of medium acuity, um, and the per diem is fifteen dollars a day, then we'll get paid fifteen dollars a day. But then that's adjusted a little bit up, but mostly down based on the number of hours of care provided, which we have to report on a monthly basis. So, so we went from that, and so that has significantly reduced funding. So one example, we have a forensics program, a, a, a re-entry program, folks who, have, uh, who are, are leaving prisons and coming back into their communities. Um, and our forensics program is the most recent one to move from a CAP model to a, uh, to a fee-for-service model, and that's cutting the annual estimated revenue from uh, 4.2 million down to 2.1. So we're losing literally 50% of our revenue for our sound re-entry, our, our re-entry, our forensics population. One of the reasons the CAP model was really beneficial is because a lot of the work that you do for a forensics population, this is, I know, maybe I'm a little bit off topic, but it's one of the, it's one of the, things, that we, it's one of the things that we're talking about. A lot of the work that you do for a, a re-entry population is around ensuring that their re-entry is stable. So you spend a lot of time with their parole officer, you spend a lot of time with community support. A lot of what you do is non-billable. And so having a cap rate really supports that program in being whole. Um, moving to a fee-for-service rate means a lot of what we do, we have to figure out a different way to fund it or we have to stop doing it. But the reason that I brought this graph up and the reason that I'm giving that as context is because our ability to subsidize or to cross-subsidize programs that were never designed to cover direct costs and contribute to overhead has dramatically eroded over the last couple of years. Are other folks experiencing anything similar? Do you have, yeah, I see a few nods. I mean, this was true at Group Health. We had programs that were subsidized by other programs, and over time, the ability to do that gets tougher and tougher and tougher. So some of the programs that I talked about, uh, and some of the programs you see here that are in the red, red in this particular, um, and one of this is actually a, a new approach that we're using. We're managing our, our 20 some odd clinical programs as a portfolio of services now. Um, before it was, it was looked at um, a, a little bit more broadly, but now each clinical program, if it's not 
uh, covering its direct costs and contributing a certain amount to indirect expenses, we have to really consider how do we, can we, how do we, and can we sustain that program? So anything that you see in the red is not even covering its direct costs. We're going to talk about one of those more in detail. Anything that's in the yellow is covering direct costs but not contributing adequately to overhead. And at the same time, we're trying to bring our overhead costs down because our you know, overhead is becoming unsustainable. There's not enough margin from clinical programs to cover indirect costs. Anything in the green is covering its direct costs and contributing to the, our targeted level to, 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 to indirect expenses or overhead. So I wanted to set that as a context because this is more and more challenging as we're trying to develop, as we're trying to launch and sustain programs that our communities need but that don't really have a, I can submit a claim and get paid for this type of a funding source. Transportation is a great example. A number of the other things that you talked about, again, are great examples. So I'm going to talk about three examples of programs. The first one is called middle school support program. So how many of you um, have kids or have neighbors of kids or friends who have kids in, uh, in schools where you know that that school brings in a mental health counselor for, to provide services? Anyone aware of that? I see a few hands, a couple of hands. My wife works in the public school system in, in Federal Way, south of Seattle, where, where we live. Uh, and, uh, and they have, and they have you know, counselors that, not just school counselors who are employed by the school district, but they have counselors that come in from behavioral health organizations like Sound to provide care in school for students who need uh, mental health or behavioral health services. So uh, that's great. Those services, and we have a very robust child and family services program and do a lot of in-school care, those services are billable. So your counselor goes to a school, they've got a panel uh, or a caseload of students in that school, they get paid for those services. The reality is the behavioral health needs of our school populations, which are really morphing dramatically over the last couple of years, are more than just, I can have a therapy session with a kid in a conference room. Right? Our teachers need support. Our administrators need support. There are some students who may feel like they need support but may be anxious around actually engaging in therapy and treatment. So how do they get supported? So this program came about, as right now we're in one school, it's been, a, it's been a demonstration project or a pilot for a couple of years funded by a family foundation. You talked about grant cycles and we'll talk a little bit more about how grants are, you know, are, are great to get things off the, off the ground, but then they're capricious. How do you know you're gonna be able to sustain that grant funding? Um, but we got a grant to do this. This program is in one middle school in our area, but the benefit of the program is now we have an on-site counselor who may provide therapeutic services, but the point of having the counselor there is that administrators, teachers, students, they're all able to access that individual as a, as a mental health professional in order to support that school in supporting the entire student population. Right? Most of what they do would not be considered billable care. We couldn't get paid for it. So the grant covers it entirely. You'll see the current funding status on this one is green. Um, I would say it's on watch. We have one family foundation that's really committed to this. They actually just increased funding uh, and are working with us to expand it to a second school. Um, but the reality is, if that family foundation decides it's no longer going to fund this, then what will we do? I mean, from my perspective, it would be great if we were in every middle school in King County. How, how would we do that? So I, part of this talk is to challenge us again to think about not just getting reimbursed appropriately for the great care that we do provide, but identifying and supporting those other care needs in our communities that don't have, that you can't submit a claim form for. Um, so again, this was uh, example number one. I need to stay on track with time here too. Example number two, um, this is a reasonably new program uh, as well, our emergency services co-responder program. This came up, actually there was, I think there was a good bit of interest in this uh, with, the, um, with the Medicaid grants that came up about was it five or six years ago now, that really when the ACOs, the, I'm sorry, ACH is Accountable, Accountable Communities of Health, came into being a lot of work with uh, emergency responders. And so uh, this came up and this was actually piloted uh, because of a donation of one of our board members allowed us to kick this off. Uh, and we piloted it with the, with a, with the municipality uh, in, uh, in King County, south of Seattle. 
Um, and, the, and the program, basically the community need is that co-responders or responders, emergency responders, and we started with police, emergency responders may be confronted with a situation involving one or more individuals with behavioral health conditions that they have trouble diagnosing, interpreting, assessing, and addressing. Right? Whereas a mental health professional um, with, as, as a collaborator, may be able to support that emergency responder in appropriately assessing and addressing the, the, the situation, also potentially avoiding an arrest, avoiding a violent confrontation, avoiding uh, a trip to an ER, right? You know, so this person would be handcuffed potentially and sent off to Harborview in a worst case scenario, and then Harborview has to figure out what to do, and maybe Harborview's not gonna get reimbursed for that, uh, that ED visit or, you know, then, then what's, the, what's the discharge plan from the ED at Harborview? So the benefit is that we have avoided in the, and the, you know, we recently had a, we recently met with the police chief to, to do a, um, we've done basically a one year look back. How is this going? Uh, and and the, the, the police department is so appreciative of this program and we have a really great, and this actually gets into another one of your points, Shane, a great mental health professional. These folks are hard to recruit. These, if Jackie, our, our MHP, who is in this particular co-responder program, who also loves this work and really, I mean, this is just kind of the perfect connection between a, a, the, the perfect MHP and the police department and it's working really well. If she decided she was moving out of the area, I mean, it's just be really, really hard to recruit for these folks. So you kind of also, like you said, always have to be thinking about how would I sustain that from the staffing side. Um, but the police department, has said it's working so well, uh, they've approached city council to extend it um, and, and to grow it. So this one is yellow from the perspective of it's covering its direct costs and contributing slightly to our indirect expenses. But honestly, you know, I'm not going to tell the, the, this municipality that they have to pay this overhead rate. Why wouldn't I do that? Why am I not going to try and charge all of my indirects, which, are, which I have to cover at some, in some way? Why am I not going to charge that back to a municipality? Pardon me? Taxes are going to go up to pay for it. Taxes, exactly. They're going to have to figure out how to cover it. Why else? They're going to say, I could hire this person directly. Why would I contract with you to provide this service? Well, there's a strategic benefit for us to be in the middle of co-responder programs because now we can work with a number of municipalities and maybe the entire county to get to some economics of scale. So we had another municipality just directly west of the one that we're currently working with that said, we want to do the same thing and we want it with police and fire. So we've, again, really hard to recruit these folks. We just recently hired one. But the challenge here is, and I don't think, the, I don't think these slides you can see all the way to the bottom. Yeah, for some reason the bottom is cut off. But you'll have them, they're downloadable. Uh, but really, again, with each one of these, I'm challenging us to think about how do we ensure that we can sustain and improve funding for these. So certainly working with city councils is great. There are potential uh, other uh, state and federal dollars that can support programs like this. Um, so, uh, so it's important for us to challenge us to think about how we would, how we would continue these. Time check. Last program. Uh, now, current funding status red. It should actually be bolded in red. I forgot to do that. So this one, the Willows is a, is, is, is a home, basically. It's a large home. Um, the community need in this case is this is for uh, moms who have been in inpatient treatment for substance use. So they've been separated from their kids for a period of time while they've been going through inpatient treatment. Now they're discharged from inpatient treatment and a lot of things can potentially go wrong. What can go wrong with the mom now that's discharged from inpatient SUD treatment? Relapse. Relapse. What else? Where are they going to live? Do you know that they have housing, safe, stable housing when they're discharged from that program? How are they going to be reunited with their kids? Have they been with another family member? Are they in foster care? Uh, so this program started quite a while ago um, where uh, mothers post inpatient treatment uh, come into this home, it's called the Willows, um, and it's staffed with mental health professionals um, and, uh, uh, and you know, it's a secure environment, a safe environment, and they're able to uh, have stable housing, they're able to be reunited with their children, right? Uh, and they are able to um, uh, basically stabilize their, um, their, um, 
their post-treatment, right, to, they're not relapsing. They're able to, you know, continue to get some, some outpatient treatment that allows them to not relapse. The other thing that the program provides is it provides a path toward stable housing post-graduation. There's a graduation from this program. Moms are typically in it for one to two years. It'll depend on the individual case. But part of graduation means that we've worked with the mom to identify uh, the next stable housing that they're going to have and help them transition into that. So this has been a great program. Uh, it doesn't come anywhere close to covering its direct costs. You can see I've got, a, I've got a little bit of math up here. I didn't create a table, but for every $100 of expense, uh, we do get some clinical, there's, there are some billable services that are provided. So we get about 13 cents on the dollar or $13 out of every 100. Uh, we get clinical care revenue for that. Okay, that's fine. It's not... Uh, not nearly enough, but the point of this wasn't to, to make it fundable by, develop, by providing clinical care. We don't want to over-serve or over-treat. Uh, we also get some housing subsidies and the clients participate in a small portion of their rent. That's another $15 out of 100. We have $72 for this for just the direct costs that aren't funded. And that's the operational cost. We actually need capital reinvestment in this house too. It's going to need a new roof pretty soon. Right? There are plumbing issues. We need to be able to take care of this facility from the capital perspective. So we actually have one operating grant right now that provides $21 for every $100 of expense. We still have about a 50% funding gap just on the direct cost. So this program is red. Um, the, the issue with this program is that years ago when it started and we were paid capitation, fine. This is wonderful. It's a wonderful community service. Um, it's, you know, it's a wonderful, folks, you know, donors love to donate to this program, um, and, and we're just, we're thrilled that we have it. But now we're at the point where we're challenged with, can we even continue this? And how tragic would it be if we couldn't do this anymore? Uh, so again, trying to challenge ourselves to say, we absolutely have to get paid for the great clinical care that we do appropriately, and at the same time, our communities need more other different and more diverse types of services in order for us to have healthy communities and safe, stable communities. So I think that is my last slide. We were going to move into a table discussion, but actually the, the, that's going to be after lunch. We've got the breakout table, so we're not going to do a small table discussion now, but what Shane and I would like to do is just use the last five or eight or however many minutes left just for sort of large group discussion. If anyone has examples they want to bring up to the large group or questions they want to ask of either of us. Yes. So you both have kind of danced all around it. I've been waiting for you to drop the term of value-based care because what you guys are approaching, I think, is the most important factor in value-based care, which is the patient compliance and the patients empowering the patient to, to take control of their own health, which mm -hmm. is a huge factor in that. So I would assume that, or hopefully, that with value-based contracting and the, or the emphasis on that, the desire to make that happen, you guys would get support because what you are doing, again, like I said, is going to improve the chances of the value-based contracting being successful. Yeah. So I'm going to take a quick stab at just, just, one, just one quick response. A really great point. I think, and you mentioned this, Shane, so start figuring out how you're going to track data early on. Absolutely. I can't count how many ER stays our co-responder has avoided. I'd love to. It's challenging. And I want to do it anyway. We want to do the program anyway. Um, so, so yes, absolutely agree. A and demonstrating outcomes for some of these programs shouldn't be elusive, but you know, I'd say in some cases it is. Really yeah, the, the current methods of value-based um, um, contracts are very ham-fisted. Like you get diabetics, right? You take a spectrum of diabetics, you have one that's completely out of control. You bring their A1C down a little bit, you get rewarded, but they're still just completely out of control. You got a fairly new diabetic, they go up a couple of points, you get hit, right? But, but really, what we're doing for the other guy was much more profound than what we're doing with the chronic. And so, you know, until they get a little bit more um, real life nuanced and really start focusing on the entire person, and I think the ACOs are getting better at it because I get a per beneficiary cost, right? And I know at least I can make an impact on, on those costs and bring that cost down and get a share of that. But right now, there's nothing that says, wow, your palliative care program has defrayed you know, 200 ER visits, and so we're gonna give you a piece of that. There's nothing like that now. And, and I think from my perspective, from a very small rule, I mean, 
I'm going to have to stalk the MCO CEOs and knock on their door at their house to get them to talk to me because they, they just were not a big enough number. Um, and again, last argument, it would be very hard for them to say, let's customize a program for Dayton for your panel of 50 or 100 Molina patients, right? But that's literally what has to happen. I mean, you really have to customize a panel by the population, by the region, by the HCC scores for that population, and then you know, come up with some way to share in that opportunity. Um, data is going to eventually tell the story or at least present the argument. So I guess I was surprised to see your Redis program was housing moms and kids. It just seems like everybody's for housing moms and kids. When you talk about the homeless problem, I always thought there were resources available. So I'm, I'm kind of shocked. I'll give you the link to our donation button on our website. <laughs> yeah, people love it, but you know we, we can't sustain it with individual donations. We do get some individual donations. Like I said, the care delivery revenue only supports a tiny portion of it. And, it, and yeah, you would think there'd be a lot of grants out there. We're, we're looking for more. But I, I think about that, you know, uh, you hear a lot about food as medicine and we're considering food as medicine. I mean, here's housing as, as mental health medicine. I can't think of a, a, a counseling session that would provide better help than, than housing for moms and kids. You can't, like, you can't solve that with a discussion about decreasing your anxiety, your, that's real anxiety, like yeah. if you don't have a place to. I think that's part of that anxiety. patchwork quilt though, because a lot of times, even when you look at school funding, behavior health pro uh, um, provider in the school, but only for kids from certain age to certain age. It's like, I mean, so you may get funding for housing, but it may literally only cover housing and not cover all of the ancillary costs that are associated for the care provided in the house. Yeah, this is the conundrum about housing. We're trying to strategically reduce our housing portfolio because it's just, it's financially, it's, it's terrible. But, but it's so needed. It's just so, and it's completely backwards. Yeah, it, it's the wrong direction. Yeah. Completely the wrong direction. I agree. Um, you know, I appreciate uh, Mike's, you know, comment that, that uh, estimating the cost savings benefit is somewhat elusive, you know, and I think we're seeing, you know, many cases where uh, the interventions now will, will have savings, but sometimes they're immediate, mm -hmm. but probably more often they're going to accrue, you know, sometime in the future, perhaps to a different payer than is the one that's currently being asked to make those investments. I mean, we're, I'm part of the conversations here with the, the uh, primary care transformation model, which you know, assumes that if more is done in primary care, then that'll you know, reduce hospital costs and things like that you know, later on, which I think is true. You know, we're still, you know, remains to be seen to what extent will the funding for those interventions, you know, will they be enough to support you know, what's, what's, you know, going to be needed to be done and things mm -hmm. like that. But how, how do you, you know, approach that, you know, when, when something says, okay, you know, we, we think it's going to save money, but we want it to save money now. Yeah. And it's really hard to make, demonstrate those fundings or the case like, gee, you're, you're, you're losing money on this, 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 and this, but you're making a you're making actually some positive margin on these things. We want to reduce those so you're actually just breaking even. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's the, the battles that we're, you know, of course, uh, fighting as an association, you know, re regarding that kind of thing. But how do you, I guess, deal as, with that as organizations and keep, I guess, the, the idea that if you continue doing the right thing, that things are going to come out okay as a result of it? Yeah, it's a really interesting statement. I'm perpetually optimistic about this. You have to be, I mean, you just you have to be perpetually optimistic that you're gonna find the next grant, you're gonna find the next right person for the role. Ultimately, CMS and Medicare gets to be the benefactor, right? Because all those chronic diseases compound over life. You know, Medicare's got the largest skin in the game from a cost savings perspective over a lifetime. And, and hopefully we can start and continue to leverage them to keep doing the you know, innovative grants that they're doing, uh, transformative efforts, because they really are funding some amazing things. I mean, I hope that the ACHs find a way to stick around. They did some incredible stuff 
now from a transformation perspective with that demonstration grant writing up though, and they're all scrambling trying to figure out revenue streams to maintain viability, mm -hmm. you know. But I mean, I guess if you look at even what, 50% of Medicaid is funded by Medicare, Medicare is the biggest beneficiary here. They're also the ones that could probably do the most to invest in it. Mm -hmm. You know, just thinking about creative ways to keep your doors open when there's a lot of facilities just closing down and not having that access, you know, care to the population. But Shane, I want to ask you, I mean, you, it sounds like you're using social determinants of health because you're saying about transportation. What is your access, what does the population look like to access to health care and helping them to find ways and means getting to the facilities so they don't show up? But are you using more of the data to understand the populations and especially in a rural area, especially like telemedicine or where internet access may not be is as challenging as enough, but getting them to the facility so they at least keep them healthier so they're not yeah. have to go that, you know, two hours away to get that acute care uh, yeah, process. So two, two comments on that. Um, we partnered with the local port, our port district. They ch they were chasing some funding for broadband to the home type of thing, and you know really advocated with our data to say this is why you know broadband in the home would make sense. And and those grants are moving forward, and we actually should have some fairly decent high speed connectivity within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm going to go one step further, and people are going to call me crazy again for this. I mean innovative. Um, let me get the right word. Um, I'm going to open childcare on hospital property. There's no child care in our community. Um, you, you, where are you going to make the biggest impact to total life uh, health? Where are you going to make the biggest impact for um, their, their ability to be successful across their life, high quality child care programs? And so it's really getting completely ahead of that curve. But the other thing it's just doing is it's engaging us with people that don't necessarily use our medical services. They're in that healthier demographic, right? They need an urgent care every now and then. Um, but now they're going to be dropping their kids off at our facility, and we're going to create another sticky point. And then for the folks that don't have good diets, the kids that don't have good diets that are on, um, you know, lunch and breakfast programs, you know, you have to wait until you get school age before you get nutrition. You know, let's, let's start feeding them sooner in the early childhood education program, including infants to six. And so really trying to find those ways to get way ahead of the curve, because if we just keep doing what we're doing, there's not enough staff, there's not enough facilities, there's not enough reimbursement. It's funny to hear you talk about childcare when you have that aging. Huh? That aging. You have a higher age population, but childcare is still up. 70 slots is what's needed in Columbia County. Like 70, there's zero. <laughs> like if I can do 42, I'd be happy, you know. But I mean, even in an aged community, still enough kiddos running around, so. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing directly supporting them, but I can tell you they're going to benefit by childcare um, because you know they, they need that as well. I mean, it, it's interesting. On the flip side, adult daycare is a thing too, and so we're looking at ways to be able to do that. Where if someone needs respite, um, they have a dementia parent that they're caring for in the home, you know, can they drop the parent off for a few hours at our assisted livings or our ALF or any of those you know elder care situations so that they get a break uh, and don't wear out. Yeah. Still working every day, yeah. but raising grandchildren. So, yeah. I mean, those are the ones that are really struggling, I believe. Because they're, <laughs> we talk about the sandwich generation, they're also probably taking care of aging parents, too. Yeah. I mean, and the, the thing about, um, about childcare and the program that we're trying to develop, we're specifically looking for a partner that has access in mind. Um, you know, generally speaking, if you've got more demand than you have seats for it, you could charge a premium, and that's not our goal here. Our goal is going to be first come, first serve, and it's really going to be we're going to take all payment methodologies, including state, um, because we know that that's, that's the way to raise all boats. All right. Thank you, Shane and Mike. Appreciate your participation.